Continue in September Seagal month, Steven Seagal was willing to show that he was more than just an actor, that he was willing to direct a movie. And it bombed. The decline of Steven Seagal's star power had begun after the release and failure of On Deadly Ground. But Sensei Seagal was not out just yet. However, this puts Warner Brothers in a bit of a dilemma. They feared that Under Siege 2 would fail at the box office. On the other hand, they really have to star Steven Seagal in this movie due to contract obligations. They did agree to fund On Deadly Ground, after all. They should have just scrapped the sequel altogether. Now, in my opinion, there are two types of sequels. The ones that are planned through careful writing and directing. These include the original trilogy of Star Wars, Lord of the Rings, Pirates of the Caribbean. And then you got the unplanned sequels, where the original movie became so successful that a sequel had to be made to capitalize on it. Now, these could go two ways. Either it could be really good and successful, like John Wick. A simple story about revenge, whereas in the sequel, the lore was expanded upon. Or it could be pretty terrible, so much so, it'll make you go, why? Why make this sequel? That's the question I have for this movie. It seems the studio was under pressure to make a sequel after the success of Under Siege. Can this movie live up to the same level as the original? Tch, <laughs> nope. So we begin the movie with a banger. A space shuttle is being launched. Hey, they went all out on the budget to launch an actual shuttle into space. Okay, not really, it's repurposed footage. A satellite called Grazer 1 is being deployed. It's being controlled by ATAC. The project is headed out by General Stanley Cooper, played by Kurtwood Smith. Well, I have a prank too. One where my foot doesn't plow through your ass. And Tom Breaker from the first Under Siege movie returns where he was responsible for the main villain going rogue. He also had a secret conversation about blaming Seagal's character for everything, and he never faced punishment. But don't worry, because in this movie, he is responsible for the villains doing bad stuff, trying to blame Seagal for everything, and never facing punishment. Grazer 1 is a particle-based weapon, capable of causing a seismic event when fired. Uh, how's that even possible? Oh, with a weapon like that, I, Dr. Extravaganza, can threaten any country in the world until they surrender to my will. The satellite comes equipped with a high-definition zoom-in camera. What do we got here? Ah, classy. Well, uh, it's a pretty useful feature. Shut up! I'm not gonna use it to spy on unsuspecting women. I'm not! Two members of the team go on leave, but not before Mr. Breaker here attempts to shoot his shot. Sorry, I already have plans. Yeah, sure, I understand. Ooh, crash and burn. Good effort, but I think you need some pointers. I know, you can learn from the master himself, Steven Seagal. He gets all the women all of the time. Where the hell have you been? Uh, is he waiting for us to clap? Okay. All right, everyone, did we give him enough attention? What's up, Casey? Hi, Casey. Casey. Hey, Casey's entered the building. This place runs a whole lot better when you're around. Let the ass kissing commence. Come on, Casey. We're gonna miss that train. I miss my brother's funeral, so uh, we're not gonna miss the train. Wait, he had a brother? Apparently, he did, despite never being mentioned in the first film. Casey has a niece he has not seen in five years, so he's meeting her at the train station. But uh oh, how will he recognize her? Looks like he's been put into a predicament. Just wander around like you're lost. Well, luckily for him, his niece ends up spotting him. This is Sarah Ryback, played by Katherine Heigl. There is a photo of the two at a screening event for this movie, where Seagal had his hand on her right breast. She was 16 at the time. What a creep. I bet all Harvey Weinstein was jealous. I guess you could say that she was... Under siege. Steven Seagal thinks he is above the law. Ryback's name is logged into a list, plus one being his niece. I wonder if this list will show up later on. We then get an awkward scene of Ryback giving Sarah a teddy bear. Hang out with teddy bears now, but it's just, you know, it's the thought. Wow, this is some stellar acting. I guess I'm not trained for this. 
This scene introduces us to Bobby, played by Morris Chestnut, I shit you not, of Boys in the Hood fame. Funny enough, later on he would star in Half Past Dead, another Seagal flick. Playing the main villain, which is a sharp contrast to playing the comedic relief here. Can I carry your bags? Ooh, nice... uh, metal. Ooh, man, almost bombed it, but nice recovery there. What compartment did you say you were in? Um, uh... My compartment. Oh man, count your lucky stars that Ryback didn't break your neck. One of the ATAC members is boarding the train and... Oh boy, Peter Green. Folks, let me tell you this. If you see this guy in any movie, I guarantee you he's the bad guy. He goes to his cabinet, meeting up with this lady. Looking all sexy and stuff. Time for a booty call. We then cut to a military airfield. Hey, uh, you guys seen the plot anywhere? Apparently this airfield can easily be broken into by a three number code. Wait a second, he pressed 69 and pound. Fucking horny movie. The place gets taken over very easily. Hmm, I've seen more security at a liquor store. Okay, this man here is Marcus Penn, leader of the mercenaries. He has a blank expression, was once in the military, and he wears a black jacket. He's pretty much the anti-Steven Seagal. Anyway, they steal some choppers, flying it off towards the same path as the train. Back on the train, Ryback has a talk with Sarah. Time goes by. Seems to fly in before you know it. Does he ever change facial expressions? You know, he didn't get the medals. What? Um... Okay. Okay everyone, take 10 while Steven tries to figure out if he wants to continue acting. We then get more hilarity between Sarah and Bobby. Oh man, that's funny. I'm sure they have this scene in just for shits and giggles and will not show up later on. Ryback here is writing his memoirs. Aren't you a little young to be writing your memoirs? That's a movie telling everyone that he's still hip and young. Okay, I know he's in his mid-40s at that point, but it's still a weird line. After his hard work of writing his memoir, he's in the kitchen making a cake. Because the train is rocking a little bit, it's cramping my style, you know, usually I could whip this pretty good. Uh-huh, sure. I'm pretty sure customers are not allowed to be in the kitchen. Also, it seems Steven doesn't know how to use a whisk. And then he puts the batter in the microwave. That's supposed to go in the oven. Come on, Ryback, you're supposed to be a chef. Gordon Ramsay would lose his shit. Pathetic. This is all you do, is it? Apparently, any rando can just flag down a train. Someone's been shot. Yeah? Where? Here. Look at me. Look at me. I'm the train conductor now. The train gets taken over by the terrorists. Holy shit, it's Freddie Mercury. And he's got one eye. I guess he's not the champion. Check the baggage. No, Frank, I don't mean shoot at the baggage. God, don't you listen to anything I say? This dude rushes in, shooting one of the chefs. Uh, where's Ryback? You know, the hero. Oh, there he is. He tosses him out, attracting the attention of everyone else. And then he just leaves as the chefs are shot to shit. Our hero, folks! And I will be honest, these mercenaries are kind of lame. Compared to the highly trained and experienced terrorists from the first film. Repelling off the ship? That was freaking cool. A bunch of equipment gets offloaded from the helicopters and onto the train. After that, the train heads off. Oh man, remember the fridge scene from the first movie? Remember? It's the same here, but it's actually lame. This, I'm trained for. <laughs> Enter evil mastermind Travis Dane, played by Eric Bogosian. Dane created Grazer 1 and faked his own death, only to reappear. Eric is not too bad playing the over-the-top villain. Not on the same level as Tommy Lee Jones, but he does a good enough job. So, the two lovebirds are brought before him so they could tell him the password to control Grazer 1. 
And for some reason, Travis mispronounces it as Grazier One. I not only invented Grazier, Grazier One, Grazier One, Grazier One, Grazier One, Grazier One. It could be worse. He could be saying it as Grazer One. They said you were dead. They also said if I push my arms together, it'll make my muscles look bigger. Travis has his female goon push a hot poker near their eyes if they don't give him the passwords. And I have to say, he has a bit of an O oh face after giving him the passwords. P U I four seven six. Oh yeah, I love it when you say it with the letters and numbers. After that, he hacks into all the adult websites and leaks the passwords. I could totally see him doing that. Okay, we get a stupid explanation on why they can't be tracked. As long as we're moving, the signal is completely transparent. Really? So, you jacked a whole train just so you can't be tracked. That doesn't make any sense. How does it even work? Hello there, it is I, Sergey, the super hacker. Oh, um, hey. So, do you need me to explain why they can't be tracked? Uh, sure, if you can. Sure thing. Oh, by the way, this is my second time appearing in a movie review. I appeared in a review of Mena's Mind. If you have not seen that review or never heard of the movie, make sure you go check it out. Okay, so, if they were standing very still, then a signal could get locked on. However, if they were constantly moving, the signal could get scrambled. In this case, on a train. It's perfect, really. But, I... How does it... How does it make any sense? I, ah... Well, that's the best explanation I have for this film. Anyway, what's Ryback been doing? Well, he's just sneaking around. Addy decides to go out for some fresh air. Travis gets to work hacking into the satellite. Oh, come on. Really? Really? It's mine again. Ryback here is going for a jog on top of the train. Fun fact, Steven Seagal was wearing a girdle in this movie to keep in that, um, that husky belly. He said it was only a temporary fix until he could lose the weight. <laughs> we all know how that turned out. Ryback spots his niece and the rest of the passengers and runs. You're gonna have him run a lot on top of the train, aren't you? Meanwhile, these two get thrown out of the train. Damn, that's cold. Travis uses Grazer 1 to target a chemical plant in China. Guangzhou is a chemical weapons plant masquerading as a fertilizer plant. The war room detects Grazer 1 on the move. And then the satellite disappears off the radar. Sir, so we designed Grazer 1 to be undetectable. But not from us, for Christ's sake. You dumbass! Yes, it was. Satellite napped. Not really catchy. Meanwhile, Ryback comes across a compartment door on the side of the train car. Huh. I don't think I've seen one of those. Ah! Hey, what the fuck you doing out there, man? Oh, it's just a nice day for a stroll. Yeah, I gotta lose the weight, after all. Ryback walks into the baggage car while Bobby freaks out. Hell no, man, I ain't coming out there. Young man, don't make me raise my voice, come here. Seagal, I don't think it's possible to raise your voice. In the meantime, I want you to go through all these bags, see if you can find a weapon or something that could be used as a weapon. Okay, sounds easy enough, right? Cover and conceal. You know that about that, right? I think somebody needs to run the definition of a weapon by this guy. The group has terrorists, ahem, clients, on the line ready to pay big money to have certain targets destroyed. But I want you to watch China very closely for the next 10 minutes. He activates Grazer 1. Targets mainland China. Oh, no. Not China. Not somebody nuclear. Okay, cut, cut. Dude, can you try to sound more concerned? The satellite is getting ready to unleash the beam. Fire at will, Commander. <laughs> Oh, those poor people at the chemical plant. Well, it could be a plant if it wasn't re-edited footage from On Deadly Ground. Shows you how cheap the movie is. And that's the problem. It looks cheap. This reeks of direct-to-TV levels of quality. It looks like one of those low-budget B-movies that I review. <laughs> Compared to the big budget and higher quality under Siege, this is a joke. Get my pies out of the oven! Uh, if China calls, tell them we're not here. So, how much does it cost to destroy something? The fee 
one billion dollars. Oh, it's time to bring in another character from the first movie, Admiral Bates. The earthquake in China? We have full deniability. Ah, uh, yeah, that whole deniability thing, it's been made null and void after that event. Ryback finds his day pack from Undeadly Ground, containing one 1911 and an Apple Newton. This movie has been brought to you by Apple. So he uses it to not call the Pentagon or the military in general. He sends a fax to a sous chef so he can call up the military. Another fun fact, the Apple Newton cannot send text or email, and I don't think it could send fax either, so... Yeah. False advertisement right there in this movie. Okay, get this. One of the clients is paying big bucks to take out a commercial airliner. Why? His ex-wife is on that plane. Yeah. That's overkill right there. I can do this. Tell him his ex-wife is history as soon as the money is deposited in our account. Apparently, the satellite is capable of doing that. So, we're making shit up as the movie goes along. Okay. What the fuck? The war room gets a hold of this and tries to take it out. On your command. Fire. They think they've taken it out, but the countdown is still going. Ken sees that the power was restored below despite cutting it off and sends Freddie Mercury to investigate. But then he gets jumped and killed. Oh. Aww. Oh well, who wants to live forever? He meets back with Bobby and gives him a gun. Oh, great idea. Uh, Glocks don't have external safeties. Travis makes a call to the war room. Wait, how did he end up in Paris? Oh, I get it, they're using a backdrop to fool the military into thinking he's in Paris, but he's not. Very clever, Travis. You're probably closing in pretty fast on Grazier One's probable location. Basically, he's calling to gloat. Typical nerd shit. He tells them they shot down an NSA satellite instead of Grazier One. Whoops. The NSA's best and only functional real-time downlooking satellite, the NSP-1. He then activates a bunch of ghost satellites, making it harder to find. It looks like somebody scribbled all over the coloring book. He tells them he's going to target the Pentagon's nuclear reactor to cause a meltdown. I was smarter than all of you while I worked there, and I'm still smarter than all of you. Basically, it's neener neener, I'm smarter than your beamer. I was smarter than all of you while I worked there, and I'm still smarter than all of you. Keep up with a smart mouth. And my foot will be nine-tenths of the way up your ass. <laughs> so now it's a race against time as Ryback heads to the front of the train to use its radio. Meanwhile, Mr. Penn here finds the blood of Freddy and gets suspicious. We have an intruder sweep the train. Ryback finds that the radio is busted, but he does get a map book. One of the goons approaches and Ryback makes quick work of him. Penn finds the body and asks the front if they found anything. Clear up there. We're checking. Hey, uh, the boss wants a sweep of the front. Okay. Nothing here. Man, these are the laziest goons I have ever witnessed. Even Arlie Ermey's mercenaries were more competent. Well, one of them heads outside to check, only to be met by the fury of Steven Seagal's kick. Fucking kick! The others react by firing wildly at him. Yep, incompetent. Ryback uses a door for cover, which looks comical. This dude didn't have his ticket, so he gets expelled. The female goon readies her trusty HK sniper rifle. Now, that's gonna be difficult since they're on a moving platform and the bullet does not travel with the train, so aiming directly at him is gonna be useless. Oh, she got him. Not a headshot or center mass shot, but he got hit. Wait, Steven Seagal got hit? He got hit? He usually doesn't get shot in his films. He doesn't demand his characters to be shot. Okay, he did get hit in Out for Justice, but I guarantee you he demanded that his characters not get shot in future movies. They think he's dead, but of course he's not. You think this is being shot? This ain't being shot. Yeah, it's only a bullet graze. Ah, fuck you, film. Penn, meanwhile, discovers the Newton and has Travis hack into it. Ryback's tactics. Ryback. 
That's what it says. I like how the goons react to the name of Casey Ryback. Casey fucking Ryback. Jesus Christ. Who's Casey fucking Ryback? Oh, Casey fucking Ryback? Casey fucking Ryback! Casey fucking Ryback! Casey fucking Ryback! Oh my god! Casey fucking Ryback! Casey fucking Ryback! Casey fucking Ryback! Casey fucking Ryback! Did you see the body? I assumed she was dead. Assumption is the mother of all fuck-ups. They check the train's manifest and find that someone is traveling with him. Gee, I wonder who could that be? Well, he zeroes in on Sarah after spotting the navy cross she's wearing. Navy cross. And then she sprays him with pepper spray. Once you get used to it, it just clears the sinuses. Uh, that's not how it works. That shit will sting for hours. Or days. Ryback, meanwhile, is doing something. What am I doing? Oh, I'm making a bomb. Oh yeah, because you could totally make a bomb on the fly. Video games have that mechanic, you know? You go get into that elevator. I gotta go beep somebody. God, look at his face. It's like he's embarrassed to say that line. Okay, see if you could spot the subtle message in this scene. Who are you gonna call? The freaking fire department because that Ghostbuster is on fire. During the chaos, Bobby grabs the CD, which allows access to Grazer 1. I got the CD! I got the CD! Wait, how would he know what the CD does? Hell, does Ryback know why the terrorists have taken over the train? Oh right, Seagal sense powers. He could sense what the terrorists are doing. Go! Yeah! Oh, the humanity! This poor dude has to go down it. Oh, he's fine, but he gets his ass kicked. They escape outside, but Ryback is held at gunpoint. Hand over the CD. So he grabs him, falling off in the process. The train has stopped. Bobby escapes from the goons. Oh, no! Please don't let me go! Ouch! No, what are you doing? Oh my god! Sweet baby Jesus, don't let me fall! Oh god! Bobby here tries to show off his shooting skills. <laughs> He's turning into Tourette's guy. Bobby runs away again, however, losing the CD in the process. Bullshit with me, you show me that goddamn CD, I'll cap your sorry black ass bitch. Uh, he doesn't seem to be an equal opportunity employee. I got my Pac Man in your ass! <laughs> oh, should have seen that coming. Back to the set of Cliffhanger, another goon rappels down. Hello, CD. Hand it over. I'll just hop over here and knock you out. And then another one shows up. It's like a video game where NPCs keep spawning. <laughs> they start up the train, pulling Ryback up. Penn shoots the rope, but Ryback grabs onto a ledge in the last second. Okay, check this out. The world is so in love with Casey Ryback that he finds this truck that already has the wires stripped off for hot wiring, and it works. <laughs> Meanwhile, the sous chef here calls the war room, because it's that easy. Casey Ryback? Casey Ryback's on this train? Compared to the first film, where a military communication device, with encryption no doubt, was used, a pair of F-117 bombers are scrambled to take out the train. While that's going on, we get a recreation of the Dukes of Hazard. Back on the train, we get a moment between Sarah and Penn. Oh man, that was good. Ah, uh, so he's into kinky pain shit. Right. Mr. Penn, she's insurance. Leave her alone. Yeah, you freaking weirdo. My bag's gone. I wouldn't make that assumption. Assumption is the mother of all fuck-ups. Bobby here is wondering what to do, however he gets caught by this asshole. But he is saved at the last minute. How's that a neck break? Let's go kick some more ass, dog. Uh, let's not. Travis redirects the train tracks into... Dark territory. Oh my god, oh my god, he said the title! He said the title! This puts him on a collision course with a petrol transport train coming the other way. Headed right toward them. Can't we contact them? Not as long as they're in dark territory. The baddies detect the incoming fighters. F-117s. Stealths. What? How would he know what kind of fighters they are? Does he have Seagal Sense powers too? 
Okay, check out this gem of a scene. Broke my bra. So, Casey, what do you say about that? It's the knife for him. Travis takes out the bombers in no time. Wait, doesn't Grazer 1 have a countdown timer? Ryback reaches a car full of hostages and starts kicking ass, with Bobby flanking the baddies. Ryback's hitting the hostage cars. <laughs> <laughs> what a memorable scene. <laughs> this dumbass shoots one of his own for no reason. Pen. One of the goons wants to flee, so Penn kills him. The car full of hostages is decoupled. Ryback is annoyed that Bobby is tagging along, so he instructs him to hijack the baddies' helicopter. Climb up that ladder and try to commandeer that helo. Oh, I'm sure it's very easy to commandeer a helicopter. Grand Theft Auto is practically a simulator on that. As he climbs up the ladder, the female goon follows behind, leading to a fight between them. He's getting his ass kicked, but then... <gasps> that move! So there was a reason for that scene. Bonk! Ryback spots his niece. As he comes closer... Did he use Jedi powers to open that door? Navy SEAL, cook, Jedi. Penn challenges Ryback to a hand-to-hand -hand knife fight. Hey, remember why the knife fight was so awesome from the first film? Uh, because, Steven, it was intense, fast-paced, and exciting? No, because of how slow and tedious it was, like this scene. Oh wait, maybe the fight from the first film was more awesome than this one. My god, it looks like both of them have to shit their asses out. Ryback has him on the defense. Okay, the whole slapping the knife out of a person's hand, it doesn't work, because the attacker is going to be holding on to the knife very firmly. Not only that, there's barely enough time to react as the attacker lunges forward and starts stabbing at random. Not to dismiss knife defense techniques, I'm sure there are some that are effective, it's just that when it comes to Aikido, it doesn't work. It really doesn't. I'm pretty sure I'm pissing off people who practice Aikido, but you know what? I don't care. I really don't. You try that in real life and see what happens. Uh, Steven, this fight scene is a little slow. Uh, don't worry, just speed it up in post-production. See? Nothing to worry about. Nobody beats me in the kitchen. Grazer 1 is about to fire on the Pentagon. Can Ryback prevent it in time? Shooting me won't do any good. ATAC can't get past my ghost satellites. That's right, Ryback. <laughs> ah, ugh. Despite being injured, and you still might shoot me, you still cannot prevent Grazer 1 from opening fire on the Pentagon. <laughs> you mean to tell me there's no way that I can shut that off? No way. No way. You cannot comprehend the power of a mad genius. Of a mad scientist. He's supposed to be a mad scientist? <laughs> what a nerd. Nerd? <laughs> Look who's talking. What? Uh, I'm not a nerd. I'm not! Well, he just shoots him, which blows up the satellite somehow. How does that make any sense? Sarah grabs a hold of the ladder, but Casey is still on the train. Whoa, hold on, that dude looks way too happy to die. Well, this is the part where Casey has to outrun a train. Yep. Well, he escapes just in time. Oh, fuck right off. He's still alive? Okay, at this point in the film, they definitely ran out of money for this scene. Ryback! Casey fucking Ryback! Oh, damn! Those fingers got sliced off like Vienna sausages. I never doubted you. Oh, yes, you did. Doubt me again, Sarah. I'm never saving you again. Got it? Can we go home now, Uncle Casey? And after that, they cut straight to the ending. Hey, we gotta wrap this film up. Leaving flowers for Steve or James Ryback. Whatever. Under Siege 2. Holy shit. Compared to the first film, this is a drop in the bucket. In a way, it's not a bad film, but it definitely suffers from a limited budget, and it shows. 
I mentioned on how it looks like a direct-to-TV film, which is funny because Steven Seagal later on would go on to make direct-to-DVD films. The shooting scenes are okay, but the hand-to-hand -hand combat suffers greatly. It's almost as if Steven Seagal didn't want to do as much martial arts scenes as his other films. At this point, he was definitely falling into the lazier side of being an action star. There's gotta be something Steven could do to regain back that star power he once had. He's gonna have to make a decision about his career. An executive decision.